This is Irene Hamrick with a presentation on vitamin B12, New Understanding and Approach to an Old Problem, with an animation by Alan Brannigan. The objectives are to increase the comfort level of diagnosing vitamin B12 deficiency, signs and symptoms, and laboratory tests. Understand the effects of vitamin B12 on various tissues. Understand the complicated pathway of absorption and become familiar with the various treatment options. We will discuss signs and symptoms of deficiency with the pathophysiology, diagnostic tests and patients at risk, and I will explain the physiology of absorption using a computer animation. At the end I will discuss treatment options. The following are signs and symptoms of vitamin B12 deficiency except which one? diarrhea, macrocytosis, peripheral neuropathy, or hyperpigmentation. Hyperpigmentation is not a sign and symptom of vitamin B12 deficiency. Signs and symptoms of deficiency can be subdivided into neurologic and hematologic, among a few others. The earlier signs are paresthesias and ataxia but can also present with motor weakness, psychosis, impotence, and dementia. Usually my patients who present for an evaluation of dementia are brought in by their families who complain of about six months of symptoms. But when I probe deeper, I usually find symptoms reaching back to about two years prior to their presentation to my office. Autonomic dysfunction, particularly with postural instability, are also oftentimes symptoms of vitamin B12 deficiency. We can see increase or decrease in reflexes and diminished vibratory sense, vision, or cutaneous sensation. Hematologic symptoms are particularly the megaloblastic anemia that we learned in medical school with an elevated MCV or mean corpuscular volume. Macroovalocytes, hypersegmented neutrophils can also be present on smear, as can thrombocytopenia, because the rapidly dividing cells in the bone marrow are dependent on the DNA production with the help of vitamin B12. Also a rapidly dividing tissue is the gastrointestinal tract. Those cells replicate about every 72 hours in its entirety so that decreased DNA production can lead to diarrhea due to malabsorption. We can also see glossitis. The pathophysiology of deficiency can be explained by the conversions that vitamin B12 is helpful in in our bodies. One of them is the conversion of homocysteine to methionine which is used in the myelin sheath protein production in our nervous system tissues and that's what produces the neurologic symptoms that we see. Vitamin B12 is also used in the conversion of methyl tetrahydrofolate to tetrahydrofolate which is used in the nucleus to produce DNA and therefore will give us the symptoms of rapidly dividing cells such as in the gastrointestinal tract, in the hair cells, or in the bone marrow. Vitamin B12 is also used in the conversion of methylmalonyl-CoA to succinyl-CoA in the citric acid or Krebs cycle. And that's why many of our patients who complain of malaise and fatigue will feel significantly better after replacement of their deficient B12 status. Diagnostic tests will include a CBC or complete blood count which will show a low hemoglobin and hematocrit, a high mean corpuscular volume or MCV. However, oftentimes the MCV can be normal but then the RDW or red cell distribution width can be elevated. There's a high incidence of B12 deficiency with normal red cell indices 
and only presenting with neurologic or other symptoms. We can test a vitamin B12 level as a diagnostic test. But what is a normal level and how is it established? Well, a normal laboratory level is established by taking a population mean and determining two standard deviations from that mean, and that is considered the normal range. Oftentimes there is no clinical correlation to those numbers. We can look at the various conversions that vitamin B12 is useful in our bodies, such as homocysteine to methionine, and measure homocysteine or methylmalonic acid. And if those are elevated, those would be indicators of a decreased vitamin B12 level. Homocysteine can also be elevated with vitamin B6 and folate deficiency. Methylmalonic acid is more specific to vitamin B12 deficiency, but both are renally cleared and may be elevated in patients with kidney failure. So at what level then do we treat vitamin B12? This study looked at patients with normal vitamin B12 level and found a large number of patients with a low normal level had elevated methylmalonic acid level. And therefore the recommendation is to replace anybody with a level of less than 350 picograms per milliliter or 258 picomoles per liter with vitamin B12 because at less than 350 methylmalonic acid levels were significantly elevated. The response to treatment is inversely related to the severity and the onset of symptoms. So in other words, the more severe the symptoms, the less likely replacement will reverse those symptoms. And likewise, the longer the onset of symptoms, the less likely they are reversible. Therefore, this study looking at dementia showed no benefit with replacement of vitamin B12 with or without folic acid in patients that were deficient because usually the onset of dementia is quite long before it is diagnosed. Vitamin B12 also has an effect on bones. It stimulates osteoblast proliferation. Therefore, patients with pernicious anemia are at increased risk of fractures. And vitamin B12 deficient patients had a higher rate of osteoporosis. Conversely, replacement of patients with 1500 micrograms of vitamin B12 orally every day reduced hip fractures in those over 65 years old. The number needed to treat in the study was 15. The following patients are at risk of vitamin B12 deficiency except stroke patients, dialysis patients, the elderly, or alcoholics. Stroke patients are not at increased risk compared to their peers for vitamin B12 deficiency. The elderly are at higher risk of vitamin B12 deficiency because their diet contains fewer calories and therefore contains less vitamin B12. Additionally, due to apoptosis of their cells in the intestinal tract, there are fewer receptors for vitamin B12 in the enterocyte of the ileum. Patients who have osteoporosis are at higher risk of B12 deficiency, as are patients who are on regular hemodialysis. Patients who use large amounts of alcohol or alcoholics are at higher risk of B12 deficiency because many of their calories are replaced by alcohol which does not contain any vitamin B12. Also, the alcohol is toxic to the enterocytes, which absorb vitamin B12. 
patients undergoing anesthesia, particularly those with nitrous oxide, are at increased risk because the nitrous oxide oxidizes cobalamin and renders vitamin B12 unusable. Also patients with atrophic gastritis, gastric bypass, and on acid suppression, particularly with proton pump inhibitors, are at higher risk of B12 deficiency. Let's discuss medication interactions. The following reduce vitamin B12 absorption or availability except which medication? Metformin or glucophage, amiodarone, cholestyramine, or omeprazole. Amiodarone does not reduce absorption or availability of vitamin B12. Glucophage or metformin competes with the calcium which is necessary for the ileal receptor transport of vitamin B12. This effect can be reversed with calcium supplementation. Vitamin B12 is very effectively recirculated in the hepatobiliary system and therefore cholestyramine, which binds very effectively to the bile, can take out large amounts of vitamin B12, rendering patients deficient. Colchicine decreases intrinsic factor receptors in ileal mucosa by blocking the villous cell proliferation. Absorption of vitamin B12 is dependent upon all except which gastric pepsin, bile recirculation, colon, or the ileum. It is not dependent upon the colon. The physiology of absorption is dependent on many steps, including in the saliva, the stomach, the duodenum, jejunum, ileum, and then serum transport in the portal system via transcobalamin. This animation explains the steps of absorption. Vitamin B12 is bound to proteins in the food that we ingest. As we eat, the R binder or R protein is released with the saliva. In the stomach, pepsin is activated by acid and pepsin splits the B12 from its protein binding sites, allowing the attachment of the R binder to vitamin B12, which transports it to the duodenum. The intrinsic factor is released from the parietal cell. In the duodenum, the pancreas releases proteases which split the R binder from the vitamin B12, allowing the B12 to attach to the intrinsic factor for transport to the ileum. In the ileum, it attaches to the enterocyte to be absorbed into the portal system and is transported via transcobalamin 2 to the liver. The daily need of vitamin B12 is about 2.7 micrograms a day. So the U.S. daily recommended intake or recommended daily allowance is set at 3 micrograms per day. You and I, we absorb about 70% of the vitamin B12 that we take in. If all of these steps of absorption fail, we still absorb about 1-2% to of vitamin B12 by passive diffusion. So if we were to ingest a thousand micrograms by mouth each day and absorb only one percent, we would absorb ten micrograms. And that is about three times the U.S. daily recommended intake. So this study looked at comparing oral replacement with intramuscular injection. Two thousand micrograms of oral vitamin B12 were given every day and compared to IM injections of 1000 micrograms every other day for the first week and then every week for a month and then monthly 
up to three months. Results showed that in the oral group, the vitamin B12 level increased faster and the methylmalonic acid level decreased faster than in the intramuscular injection group. So there's really no reason to give intramuscular injections anymore. There were several studies done to look at what amount of vitamin B12 is required to treat various deficiencies. Because deficiency occurs first if there is no intrinsic factor available or if bile is absorbed because vitamin B12 is so heavily concentrated in bile. So if these systems fail, then replacement at higher levels is required. However, if only acid is absent, such as through H2 blockers or atrophic gastritis, and intrinsic factor is still active, then smaller amounts of vitamin B12 suffice, such as those in a multivitamin, because the crystalline form of vitamin B12 is readily absorbed in these cases, as long as it doesn't have to be split from the protein binding sites in food. One study looked at what amount is necessary to replace deficiency from proton pump inhibitors, which are so widely used nowadays, and showed that 50 micrograms a day are not enough. So the recommendation is to use 1,000 micrograms daily. There are various formulations available. Besides the intramuscular route, there is also a nasal gel available. There is no toxicity even at high doses of vitamin B12. If I took a whole bottle of vitamin B12, I would make very expensive urine, but have no adverse effects from it. In cost comparison, the oral replacement is the cheapest cost. Intranasal gel is the most expensive. However, in certain settings, the IM injection may be the cheapest. This study looked at the cost of medication administration and found that a monthly IM injection is less expensive in the nursing home than a daily administration of an oral pill. In conclusion, identify deficiency early as advanced neurologic damage is largely irreversible. Treat if vitamin B12 level is less than 300 picograms per milliliter or 258 picomoles per liter. Or check metabolite levels such as homocysteine or preferentially methylmalonic acid. May use oral vitamin B12 replacement at 1000 micrograms daily. Thank you for your attention.